We're in Acts 25 and 26. I'm going to do them both. So now I've told you to read a chapter ahead, and for some reason, God's having me go two at a time lately. So uh, you might want to read ahead too, if you, it'll, or it'll be a surprise to you. This is how it reads. Acts 25 reads like this. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus, because Felix has been removed because he's kind of a nutcase, uh, went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. He's the, the governor that replaces Felix. A way better man, actually. He's a pretty good man. Problem is he dies in a couple of years, so he doesn't hang around much to, to be the governor of Judea. He, it would have been helpful if he was. But three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them because, hey, here's the new guy. Let's see if we can kind of secure this quickly. To have Paul transferred to Jerusalem for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. All right, I've got to take a break. So just so we understand, two years ago when Paul was, he went to the temple and, and he's just worshiping God, some Jews from Asia know who he is, and he's like, oh, that's the guy that's just trying to decimate the Jewish culture by telling everybody about Jesus. And, and even though a lot of us believe in Jesus, we don't want to throw away our old culture and our laws, and we feel like he's doing that. So let's beat him up. And they start doing that. Let's kill him. Yeah, let's do that. And then Claudius Lysias, Lysias comes in with a whole bunch of Romans, and he pulls him out of that mess, and the Sanhedrin tries to kill him again when he talks about the resurrection because half of them believe it and half of them don't. And then sends him with 470 men to get safely to Felix because he finds out they've got 40 guys that are going to kill Paul on the way. That was two years ago. Two years have passed with Paul in jail. And, oh, Felix finally does enough to tick Rome off enough to get dismissed. Well, that's awesome since he's lined, uh, uh, um, he's crucified just lines and lines of Jews on the streets of Caesarea and stole stuff from their houses and used Romans to loot them. He was a mini Hitler of his time, and he was ruthless. And he was so ruthless that even Claudius, who was a ridiculously ruthless emperor, says, you're too ruthless. I'm pulling you out of there. Pulls him out, puts this Festus, who's, who's well known to be a pretty, pretty good guy, especially for a Roman governor, in his place. But Paul's just been sitting in jail all this time. He didn't do anything wrong. He knows it. Everybody knows it. Everyone knows it. But these Jews that want him in jail, and many of them believers in Christ, hate him so much that the moment the opportunity comes to take him down again, they jump on it. Three days. Festus is there three days. Oh, there's a new guy. Quick, send a bunch of people in. We might be able to get him sent to Jerusalem, and then we'll ambush him and kill him. He won't know about it, and so it would be a great chance for us to kill Paul again. Like, how do, you, how do you harbor that much hatred that long, especially as a believer? How do you harbor that much hatred towards someone else who is also a believer? How, how do you harbor so much anger that you are willing to kill that person and, and, and all of a sudden, it's all fresh. You're ready again. You know, they've been sitting there. Oh, I can't get him. He's in Roman jail. New opportunity. Two years is a long time, people. Life has moved on. Stuff has happened. Romans have killed more Jews. It's getting messier in Jerusalem. They're a decade away from the Romans coming in and crushing the whole thing. Destroying the temple till killing so many Jews, blood flows down the temple. It is a mess, and it's on its way, and they all see the storm cloud coming. They have a reason to hate the Romans. They have no reason to hate Paul, and they're harboring it and holding on to it. We had a home fellowship on Friday, and the, we, we spent a long time in worship, really just, just played for a long time and just worship. And then when we, we broke from the worship, kind of had to tear ourselves from it because it was just... It felt like today, I think. Um, started to get into the Word. 
and what was God doing in anyone's lives. And I, I didn't really have any specific purpose. I just said, hey, what has God been saying to you? And to everyone, <laughs> to a man, to a person, it was about forgiveness. It was really powerful because everyone had something to say about it. Uh, Steve, you had something wonderful to say that stuck with me. He said, you know, when, would you care? Do you care? I'd probably do it anyway, but I'm just asking. <laughs> okay, all right, so, all right, thanks. So, <laughs> he said, it's so weird. You, when someone does something to you and it hurts, but it's way back here, and, and life's moved on, and you're just, you know, you're on a drive, it's a nice day, everything's good. And then you get thinking about that thing, and, it's, and it brings it fresh, like it just happened. It's like, it, he said, it's out of time. It was back here. And all of a sudden, it's present. It shouldn't be here. It like took the DeLorean and got over here. It, it should be over there. Why is it here? You know, and you're driving. Uh, I've driven to work, and by the time I got to work, I left looking at the foliage and got here steaming. Because it's in my head, and it's something that happened a long time ago. Satan knows how to throw logs on that fire. You know that, right? Yes. The very thought about it came from him in the first place, just so you know. It's in your flesh, though, and you're letting it tumble and tumble and tumble. And I say letting it kind of loosely because it's really hard to take it out. We actually don't have the ability to. That's why most of these guys in the Sanhedrin are not believers, of this 270 that, that kind of govern religious things, and it's all religion, it's all law, it's no Jesus. And they don't have that, and so they don't know how to forgive, so that same burn stays there. And when something else brings up the opportunity, ooh, we could kill that guy again. It brings it back as if it just happened yesterday, even though it was two years ago, and even though it was them that did it to him. If anyone should be mad, it should be Paul rotten in a jail cell for two years for just what? Bringing gifts for the poor and doing a Nazarite vow, which he just did, but they asked him to do another one, which involves fasting and cutting hair and all kinds of stuff and paying dues. He does it again because he's trying to show everybody, I respect Jewish law. I respect my heritage. It's from the Jews that Christ came. I respect that. But I have been called to invite the Gentiles so everyone might know this Jesus and no one's left out. And they hate him for that. They're ready to kill him for it. And all of a sudden, it's brand new. It's brand new. The pain comes up. You know, it could be all the way Back to high school. Let me give you 10 seconds. Think of someone you hate. From high school. It won't take you long. It won't take you long. You probably just got out of it. <laughs> but for a lot of us, you know, who that was like 30-something years ago, it, it takes seconds to think of someone. You have no idea if that person's alive or what they've gone through or what God's took them through. They might be your brother or sister in Christ right now. But the moment you think about them and think about that situation, it's just like a smell that you smelled in high school. You ever walk through the corridor of some place you haven't been in a long time, but they haven't changed the building yet, and the scent of it just goes, and it's like a time capsule. Hate is a time capsule. Unforgiveness is a time capsule, and it takes you right back to the spot. And then you're just sitting in it. And everything was honky-dory. You woke up having a great day. Everything's happy. Sun shining. Look at the foliage. Oh, remember that guy? Oh, I hate that guy. Couldn't believe he said that in front of people. And then it starts. Snowballs rolling down that hill. There's just, there's just one answer. There's just one answer. You lay it at the cross of Jesus Christ. You say, take that pain out of me. I can't do it. I don't even have it in me to make that go away. If they were Lego blocks, that'd be fantastic. Hatred, unforgiveness, done. But it's not that simple. You have to take it to the cross. I had a pastor once tell me, you have to unload your guns. 
You don't write someone a letter trying to get things right and reconcile, reminding them of all the stuff they did to hurt you. It doesn't get you anywhere. You go, your gun's still loaded. You just tell them that you want it to be right again. So you love them even if you don't because you're relying on Christ to change that in you because we're called to forgiveness. The whole kingdom's about it. If we can't get that right, we, we've gotten nowhere. The whole kingdom is about forgiveness, and if we can't do it, if we can't figure it out, if we can't reconcile broken relationships, if we can't get there, we are in trouble. We've got to be able to do it. It's heavy because the moment you mention forgiveness, you think of the person you're not forgiving or the plethora of people that you're not forgiving. We all have an assortment. Uh-huh. It's like sorting laundry, lights, darks, you know, hate, 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 totally loathe. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you, ever, you ever sat up there like the Grinch <laughs> reading the names? <laughs> it's rough. Two years should be enough time for it not to be fresh but here's the problem hate stays in tupperware yeah. you, you pop it you it could be two years later that thing's in an aluminum can you got to take the can opener take it out it's just as fresh as the day you made it and you'll feel it the only way past it is the miracle of jesus christ The only way past it is the blood of Jesus Christ washing over that hurt and making. Because you're not, it's not about the other person accepting your forgiveness. If it was, it's not going to work most of the time. Because they won't many times. It's about you being free. All right. I got three verses. That wasn't too bad. So Festus comes in, the Jews just pounce on him like seagulls on a sandwich at Reed State Park. They're on him, and, and Festus is just like, uh, gosh, wow, these guys are really active. I, I, he, this guy must have done something really bad. Um, and they said, just transfer him to Jerusalem. We'll take care of it. Oh, yeah, they will. They're literally preparing another ambush. They will kill him, and they'll kill themselves trying to kill him if they have to. They, they hate that much for another person's pursuing God. Boy, we got to get this figured out. Verse 4, and I'm talking personally. Don't think I'm not. I'm talking personally. I got winged this morning. So, you know, it's very, it's, it, it's, it's an ongoing cycle we have to be in of forgiveness. It's an ongoing cycle because people will give you, the, here's the great news. You're going to get all kinds of opportunity to practice this skill. That's the good news. Like You're like, wow, what if I forget how to forgive? Don't worry. There are many, many more chances. You will get like six today. You know? Uh, so just, it's okay. If you're forgetting how to do it, you'll, you'll keep getting more. You'll be immersed in opportunities to forgive. So Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Verse 5, let some of your leaders come with me. And if the man's done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, that's a weird one to me, eight or ten, well, whatever. Jesus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court. See, he's getting on this fast. Felix is like, uh, I'll settle it when Lysias comes. I'll, I'll take care of this eventually. He, you know he's not going to. Festus jumps on it. See, he convenes the court. The next day, he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. And when Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. And they brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove any of them. Then Paul made his defense. I've done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or even against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, because he's just getting into power and he still is a politician, 
He's got to deal with the powers that be, and here's this powerful group of Jews locally. He's like, well, if I make things easy for them, they'll probably make things easy for me. Uh, when Pilate washed his hands of Jesus, it wasn't two or three years for his own people killed him because he couldn't maintain the calm. So getting some riots going gets you into a lot of trouble if you're a Roman leader. So you don't really want that. You squish it really hard or you try to work with the people. Festus is trying to work with the people. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Well, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Meaning, I'll be there, I'll come, but they kind of want it there because that's where it happened. Paul answered, because he knows they're trying to kill him. It was his son that caught, it was, I'm sorry, his nephew, he has no son. It was his nephew that caught the plan two years ago and told him about it. So he knows they're going to try to ambush him and kill him. Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. If, however, I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. See, this is the moment. This is the moment, and it's so odd. But this literally is the moment Paul's been waiting for. He knows God is sending him to Rome to speak to the high ups of Rome about Christ. He knows what his job is, and he's got a perfect opportunity. Okay, Festus is more of a leader. He'll follow the rules more. If I appeal to Rome as a Roman citizen and I've done nothing wrong and he can tell, he says, as you yourself know very well, you can look at the documents, I am not guilty of anything. I appeal to Rome. I appeal to Caesar. This response is going to be crucial. See, here's that thing. You know the scripture how it says, be prepared in season and out of season? Be prepared when you feel like being prepared, and be prepared when you drove to work thinking of that person you hate. Or you just woke up not feeling great. Or you just don't want to see anyone you'd rather hide today. Sometimes you you get, I feel you, sometimes you get that option and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're having that bipolar day where you just want to hit the first thing that walks through that door. We all have these windows where you heartbeat monitor emotionally. But we've got to be prepared in season out season. He's been in jail for two years after being beat up, after everything that happened on three different missionary journeys. You think he just wants to appear before the court again, the Roman court? Think he's looking forward to telling them the exact same story that did no good the other three times? He's probably like, oh, gosh, call me out again? You losers. But he goes and he sees it. It's not how he's thinking. He goes and he sees it as an opportunity to share Christ with them. Because we learned last week when he gets, well, I mentioned it, when he gets in front of the people he's about to get in front of, he says, I wish you'd be just like me minus the chains. If I was in that jail cell, I'd say, I wish you'd be just like me, including the chains. But it's not his thought. He's spending, what do you think he's doing in jail? You think they give him a TV set? You think there's a real cool exercise program in the Roman jail cell? He's praying. He's going over the scrolls. He's reading. He's spending so much time with God that it's coming out of him left and right. Out of an overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, and he's loading himself with Christ regularly. He's got nothing else to do. And while in here, he's writing some of the churches, and the, and the Bible starts getting made. After Festus, verse 12, her, uh, had conferred with his council, he declared, Huh, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. Verse 13 says, A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice, remember, last week we talked about Felix, that really horrible governor, and his 30-year younger wife, who's barely 20 years old, Drusilla, and she's a piece of work. 
She's the gorgeous younger sister of this very pretty Bernice, but she's considered prettier than Bernice, and Bernice hates her for that. Bernice is the sister of Drusilla, and Agrippa is Drusilla's brother. They're all brothers and sisters, but they're coming like a married couple, king and queen. It's a very, very messed up relationship that, as far as anybody can see in history, looks like they were acting like a husband and wife, even though they're brother and sister. It's a messed up deal. They're Jewish. A few days later, King Agrippa, this is from the Herod line, this is Herod that killed all the babies in Bethlehem trying to kill Jesus. That's their line. That's their lineage. This is Herod that consulted with Pilate. Same lineage. Uh, not the same person. Same lineage. All Herod. Herod, Herod, Herod Antipas. Now the Agrippas. Herod Agrippa. This is that, that line to kill Jesus, Pilate and Herod. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there's a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders and the Jews brought charges against him and they asked that he be condemned. They want to kill him. And I told him that it's not Roman custom to hand over anyone before they faced their accusers and had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. That doesn't seem very Roman to me. It seems like they kill kind of everybody. But he, he's like, that, but this guy, he respects the law. So he's like, okay, it's not Roman custom. I've got to give him a chance to face his accusers and defend himself. And when they came here with me, I didn't delay the case. But I convened the court the next day, and I ordered that the man be brought in. And when his accusers got up to speak, they didn't charge him with any of the crimes I expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. Well, that's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? You either think Jesus is dead or you think he's alive. Yeah, there's only, you know, is he dead or is he alive? <laughs> he rose from the dead, first fruits. And any of us that understand that and can say, Jesus is Lord of my life, will live forever with him and also defeat death. He can defeat the unforgiveness in you. He can, he can defeat the death in you. I was at a loss, Felix continues, on how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he'd be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I'd like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. You might be thinking, well, why didn't they hear him over the last two years when Bernice's sister was part leader of Judea with her Husband Felix, because they hated him. Agrippa had, had uh, given out Drusilla to this other king who Felix wooed her away from, and they don't have a lot of love between them. And then Bernice hates her younger sister because she's prettier. So they finally, there's someone new, and they're like, hey, we'll go meet this guy. He's got to be better than Felix and our sister. Our sister is it's messed up. Festus said, oh, sorry. Festus said, tomorrow you will hear him, because he wants to hear him himself. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, the king and queen, came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in again next day. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found that he'd done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I got nothing to write about him that's definite to, the, to his majesty. Therefore, I've brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I, got, I might have something to write to Rome. For I think it's unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. So I've got to read it for a second, but please stay with me. It's very, very worth it. Hang in there for a second. I know it's kind of a lot there. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you've got permission to speak for yourself. 
So Paul motioned with his hand and he began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you're well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way that I've lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem, they've known me for a long time and they can testify, if they're willing, that I conformed to the strictest sect of our religion and I lived as a Pharisee. And now, it's because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I'm on trial today. This is a promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, Agrippa, it's because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? He just kind of interrupts himself. He's explaining the situation. He's going, wait, wait, wait. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? A God that can speak the world into existence. Why do you think it's incredible that he can raise the dead? Why do you think it's weird that well, don't you think it's odd that he'd make us for like this 100-year span or less and we just die and then there's nothing else? You don't think that's weird? Why do you think it's incredible that he raises the dead? Of course he raises the dead. You don't think it's incredible that he knits a baby together in its mother's womb? You don't think that's amazing? You don't think it's wild that you take a bite of a hamburger and just digest it? You don't have to think, digest, 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 digest. Go where you're supposed to go. Not there. Not there. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about breathing or making your heart beat. All this stuff just naturally just goes supernaturally. And God knows when to snuff that wick. But you've got a spirit inside you that's internal. Look, just look inside how deep you feel, how deep you think, how deep you are, how deeply you're made. Deep calls out to deep, the word says. We're made eternal. You can't die. Just this. You get a new one of them that can't die. Why should you think it's incredible that God raised the dead? Of course he does. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from synagogue to another, one synagogue to another, to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme, to lie. Coerced blaspheming. I was so obsessed with persecuting them, I even hunted them down in foreign cities. He tells us that. We only know about Damascus. We don't know about the ones he made it to. One of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, he saw King Agrippa nodding off. About noon, King Agrippa, you know, kind of pull him back in. As I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, which is why... May, might be why some of the ones with him didn't understand it, but it might have been that it was just for him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. You know what a goat is, right? Okay. People are like, well, I don't own a goad. <laughs> there aren't goads at work. There's no goads in my car. Uh, I don't have a goat in my wallet. I don't really know what that is. And, and, you know, some know, some don't. A goad is a sharp, pointy stick that you direct sheep with. And you, you can discipline sheep with it, or you can drag, drag them in, got a little hook on it and stuff. But if you kick against it, it's like kicking against a thorn, like a cactus, like kicking a cactus. If you get really mad and you want to kick something, kick something soft. You don't kick a cactus. You know, I'm so mad, tick, it just sticks. He said, it's hard for you, Paul, to kick against the goads. And, you know, that seems so funny and stupid. But when you won't forgive, you're kicking against the goads. You just, 
And I know it's trite. I know it's trite. I know so many of you have heard it, and I know I've said it before, but it truly is drinking poison and hoping it hurts the other person. You're, you're, you're kicking against something sharp. It hurts every time you touch it, every time you think about it, and yet you're still kicking and screaming, and you can't get rid of it. Unforgiveness is just sheer pain. Then I asked, Paul still speaking the story, because this, this is the first time you hear this piece of the story. He's told this two or three times in the Bible, but it's the first time he says, Jesus said, why are you kicking against the goads? He gives him, he's given us a little bit more, new nuance of the story. And then I asked, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Just understand that, people, for all of us, this is me included, when we will not forgive... Jesus is saying, it's me you're persecuting. It's not someone else. It's me you're persecuting. You're kicking against the goads and it hurts you. You know why? Because he loves us with all of his heart and he loves the other person with all of his heart. There's nothing worse. I hate it. There's nothing worse when your kids are fighting because you love both of them. And you can even see that one's clearly in the wrong and one's clearly in the right, although usually it's both. And you can see it right in front of you. And you still, it's so painful, cause, especially if it's really bad. Because you love them both. And you just want it to stop. Why are you persecuting me, Paul? Why are you persecuting me, Doug? Let it go. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as Jesus speaking to Paul. He's telling us the story. Jesus said to him, now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared here to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you've seen and what you will see of me. I'll rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open up their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, meaning they're under the power of Satan and they do not know. They're caught in it. It's a maelstrom that they live their life in and they don't even know different. That's the problem. That's why it's so confusing to try to get Christ across to someone when they were just caught in that maelstrom of Satan's possession. But you're meant to be the Lord's. He chose you when he died on the cross for you. And from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I wasn't disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus and to those in Jerusalem and to all Judea and then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That's why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God's helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses would said, said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer and as the first to, to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. All right, so listen. When you're trying to get to the place where you can forgive something and let something go, you're trying to get to the place where it's like, i got to let this go. I can't just keep living here. I can't live here anymore. Or you have no desire to and you're fuming mad about it every time you think about it, then that's a good indicator that you need to let it go. And you're there. There's no way to get there when you are confident of your own righteousness. There's no way to get there. You can't get there. What you have to identify with is your own sin. When you can identify with your own sin and that Christ had to die for you on the cross and he forgave you and he came out of nowhere to do it. You weren't seeking him. He sought you. 
And when you get to that conclusion, you get there, you then realize, well then, well then I should forgive. I should pursue someone to forgive them. Even if they don't deserve it, even if they shouldn't even have this coming. I don't stand on some high throne like, wow, I'm the holy prominent one and you're just the one controlled by Satan. Or, you're another believer, but you're one of them Christians. Or whatever. You have to identify with your own sin. Do you see what Paul does? He gets before all of these ridiculously unspiritual leaders. Two of them are brother and sister looking like living like a couple. And no one in, and they're so corrupt and messed up that no one's even challenging this. They're Jewish. King of the Jews, Agrippa. No one's even challenging this mess. Because they're all a mess. Jesus, they've tried to pull out of the equation. What happened when they pulled Jesus out of the schools? How well are they doing? I taught at them for 26 years. I know what it's like. We've got teachers in this room. We know what it's like. You keep pulling Jesus out. We didn't have people walking around shooting up all our schools. We didn't have guidance counselors helping children choose to change their gender at five, but they can't pick a tattoo till they're 18. We, we didn't have this mess. But you pull Jesus out and say, no, no more prayer. I, I was lucky to be able to keep my Bible on my desk and still be hired. You know, you, you, you pull that out and then you just hope for the best. Why would you do that? You can't pull Jesus out of your family, out of your life, out of your behavior and expect that you're not on a sinking ship now. You can't. And he'll come and say, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the goads? He'll come again. Why? Because he didn't come just once. He didn't just die and come once. He comes again, and he'll come again, and he'll come again, and he'll come again, because you're going to sin again and again, and you're going to be sinned against again and again, and that's in the church and out of it. So what you're going to have to do is keep taking it to him. And do what Paul did, spend more time with him. Don't just hope it gets better. It's not going to. It won't just suddenly go away. Time doesn't heal wounds. It doesn't heal wounds. They're sitting in Tupperware inside of you. And you just pop that lid and it's just fresh like it was before. Time heals nothing. You think you're healed and you're tricked into being healed because you're not in the face of that other person and you don't see them anymore. The moment you see him at all, whew, there it is again. You have to identify with your own sin because when you get there, you realize you were freed from hell, from an eternity without God, by God, at his cost. At his son. You were freed. And once you remember that, once you get back to that, because any of us, when we're first saved, you don't go, oh, Jesus is real. Could you get rid of them? I hate them. Yeah. That's not the first words out of your mouth. Oh, I finally know you. You're all powerful. Well, smite these. That's not what anybody does. You come crying because you didn't get smoked. You come crying because you, you identify with your sin. You get it. I wasn't on my way to heaven. And now I am and I had no business being here. And then when someone does something very cruel and even continual to you, you can forgive not in the hopes that they change, although of course hope for that. But Paul even said, I hope for that for you. That's how you know he had a ton of Jesus inside of him. I hope you change for you. I'm already free. I'm on my way to Rome. There's nothing any of you bozos can do to stop it. I'm going to Rome. God told me. A hurricane won't stop me. I'm going to Rome. 
even his motivation to preach to the Gentiles. I'm almost finished. This is what happens. Verse 24 says, At that point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out, of, you're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and is reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it wasn't done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I love that. <laughs> do you believe the prophets? You saw his face kind of, I know you do. I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And do you understand that at this point, Paul didn't say a thing about him becoming a Christian. See, it's easy to read this and think, oh, yeah, Paul was asking him to be a Christian. Paul wasn't. Never said a word about it. He was explaining his own situation. You ever explain your own situation, something Jesus did in your life? Someone said, what do you think? I should be a Christian? You think I'm just twisted? I'm evil? Is that what it is? No, no. I, uh, what's the matter with you? I'm just trying to tell you something that God did in my life. I, I just couldn't believe it. It was so amazing. You know, well, what, what am I, evil? Am I going to hell now? We, we, well, yes, but I mean, but that's not what I was talking about. I'm just trying to tell you testimony. You don't have to. That's the good news. You, it could be different. But he quickly comes back with King Agrippa. Oh, you think in such a short time you can make me a Christian? And you know why? Why all of this happens? It's conviction. Someone, all of us know. All of us know deep calls out to deep. We're made deeply. And the deepest parts of you resonate with God. But when you're under the control of Satan and deep parts of you are resonating with God, there is a massive conflict and it ticks you off. Yeah. It did me. Before I knew who he was, it did me. It made me squirm and be uncomfortable. The name of Jesus is powerful. Deep calls to deep, and it calls to what's inside of you. And someone gets angry because they're busy kicking against the goads all the time. He doesn't ask him to, he doesn't say you should believe like I do. He doesn't even mention hell or anything. Oh, you think it's such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? But Paul's response is beautiful. Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. And you know what he did? He went, except for these chains, chink, 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 because he doesn't have any other chains. He's only got the metal ones that the Romans put on him. He doesn't have any internal chains like the other guys all do that are listening to him. He's not wearing those. He said, I wish you could become like me except for these chains because the chains you got are eternal and they last so much longer and they're so much more painful and they cut the skin so much worse. I wish to God you were like me because then you'd be free. Who well, you are in jail? Just now. Just for now. You guys live in jail, that's what he's telling them. You live there. You can't get out. Until you invite Christ in, you'll stay there. The king rose, because he's like, I can't listen to this anymore. And with him, the governor, and Bernice, and those sitting with them. And after they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man isn't doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. And you think, oh, rats, he missed his chance. No, he didn't. If they set him free, he had an ambush waiting for him. He is going to Rome. 
This is his ticket. He's going there to preach Christ to more Gentiles and have a much more powerful opportunity and audience so it can split out further into the Roman regime. One of the books is titled Romans in the Word because he keeps preaching the Word to them. Deep calls out to deep. And we're deeply made, and that's why you have deeply seated feelings. You can't think them off. You cannot think them out. You can't outthink unforgiveness. You can't think of all the reasons that you should let it go. You've got to take it to Christ. You've got to beg him to remove it. Like you'd beg him to remove a migraine. Like you'd beg him to remove a broken situation in your life that every day matters to you. You've got to beg him to get rid of it. And when he comes and washes it, it won't be a thing anymore. Some I'm waiting for. Some I've experienced. And I'm praying for God to make me a better man. But unforgiveness has got to be a bigger part of who we are. It can only happen when you identify with your own sin. Last thing I'm going to say is this. Luke 18 talks about this Pharisee who watches this guy come into the temple. He's beating his breast. It's Luke 18, 13. And the guy's like, I, I'm such a sinner. Everything I do is wrong. I'm so sorry. I'm so twisted, God. I haven't done anything right. I, don't, I, I've, I haven't been here in so long, and I'm so sorry. And the, and the Pharisee look at him and go, what a mess. That guy's a mess. And it was the guy that was crying and beating his breast that the scripture said went home justified before God. You want to go home justified before God? Identify with your sin. Know what it is. Know it's still there. Know it's taken care of by the king of kings. Know that it's still a battle, but he solved it at the cross. So let's not kick against the goads and pick it back up. Lord Jesus, as we go into our day-to-day, as we go into our week this week, we'll get more practice to forgive. We'll get more opportunities to do it, but those aren't really the ones generally that I'm talking about, Lord, that you're talking about today. You're talking about deep things that hurt and have hurt. I pray for freedom for your church family here, God including myself, the ones that really hurt and the ones we haven't been able to freely let go of yet. God, it's just so much weight to carry around. The ones I have let go of, it has been so freeing. And I don't even think about it anymore. That was the other thing Steve said to me. I forgot what they even did after forgiving. Like I forgot what it was. What a wonderful place. I want that kind of amnesia, Jesus. I want it. A spiritual amnesia. I don't remember what was done to me anymore. There's forgiveness. Let it happen for me. Let it happen for your people. Let it happen for us. We love you so much. Keep our eyes on you. Keep our hearts with you. And I pray, Jesus, this week, everybody gets in the word and that we're purposefully straining towards the kingdom to take it by force, not from you, from the world around us. We love you and praise you. Amen. Have an awesome day, everyone. God bless.